Matthew, have you looked at the Tuts for You um, IDA tutorials, and would you recommend those for kind of further practice? Uh, I am aware of them. I've never used them. So uh, that I could not tell you. I've used um, crackmes.de. Didn't that site get taken down? Probably. I'm not surprised. Because <laughs> I was trying to pull stuff down from the yeah, email says it. That's yeah, still down. There are some interesting, uh, interesting examples there. Um, so one of them was called Hyper and Pack Me Too. And it essentially was its own uh, bytecode interpreter. So, so it basically, they, they took a program, they, they ran it through this, this bytecode. Uh, it, it created bytecode for so it translated x86 assembly into this new language, and then it insert, inserted an interpreter into the executable. And so, when you took a look at the thing, it was just this big loop, and it would read a byte, and then it would decide, does it want to execute something? So, there's this big switch case statement, and it would decide uh, what what commands to run based on, on the, the byte that it read. So it was not risk, uh, risk it was sysk. So you probably wouldn't like it. Hey, I use what works. <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, it, so a very interesting way of obfuscating the meaning of, of an executable because it None of the, the code is natively ever available in x86. So it's not as if it decodes it in the, into, into place and then runs it. It actually says, well, this opcode means that we should perform an OR and set these flags. So it had its own registers. Like, there were variables that acted as registers. It had its, its own stack. It had uh, flag registers. It was definitely a it was very challenging. You know, so the other mirror of all the files. Ah. Uh -huh. <coughs> Is that available, Zeno? Okay. So Zeno's saying uh, he's going to put some of the crack me's stuff on in his transfer folder. So keep an eye out for that. Um, the really interesting uh, little reverse engineering puzzles. I'm checking them out. I just googled <coughs> crack me. There's also some mirrors as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it's the third one down. It says malware reversing. So apparently Xeno said some of these are detected by whatever security products you guys are using. <laughs> Some of it will plug in even. Yep, I've done that a few times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> had to go off, get an email a couple hours later. We found 17 viruses on them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I found the Def Con CDs in my computer at work. <laughs> that last so it minutes. looks like we're, uh, uh, we're ready to go on. here. All right, so we ready? Let's see what we're going to this guy. Flash. <laughs> So how many of you have ever written an object-oriented program? Pretty much everybody. All right. How many of you have used C++? OK. Kind of, sort of. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, object-oriented code and how, OK, no C++. All right. That's OK. So we're going to talk about object-oriented code and how it might look if you're, if you're looking at some code compiled using it. Um, so I'm going to talk about ways of identifying that, this, that something might potentially be using uh, classes uh, and, and structures that 
define function uh, functionality uh, and talk a little bit about inheritance and what that will look like as well. <coughs> so when you when you have a an object uh, and it has member functions, uh, it it has what's called a this pointer, okay, and this pointer is essentially uh, it says uh, this is where the, the base of the object is. So yesterday I showed you I, I wrote a struct up here called person. So let's say we created a person object, all right? So this would point to the beginning of it. All right, and then I said uh, it had a name, okay? And name was 128 bytes. And then I said um, it's got an H. So that's at byte 132. Uh, that, that ends at byte 132. Um, and then maybe it has one to do another person. Let's say a spouse. Okay. So this refers to the beginning of the, the object. Now, if for some reason this thing had uh, used inheritance, the first thing I have is a B table, a BF table, or a B table. Um, this is basically just a pointer to some other number. Which then contains a function. So, so, so the B table is a pointer to a list of functions. Yes, it's a pointer to a list of functions. So when you when you have inheritance, you say um, maybe okay for the person object, maybe they have uh, the maybe a function is move. Okay, and <coughs> then you've got so you've got uh, let's say you have a, a runner, okay? So a runner would be a specific kind of person. Maybe their move function would would move them quicker than the standard person, okay? So that that's that's the idea of of, uh, of inheritance. And uh, so this this virtual function table will have uh, the different the different uh, addresses of the functions. That a particular object would use. Okay, so, and we'll come to that soon. But right now, what I what I, what I want to focus on is the this pointer. So that says this is this is where my object begins in memory. Okay. So um, I've got some some details in here about different compilers. So different compilers uh, use di different registers uh, as a convention, <coughs> but generally uh, what you're going to find is ECX is used as the this one very frequently. So what happens is uh, we talked yesterday about there are different calling conventions, and generally you're going to see standard call, which is a bunch of pushes followed by a call. In this case, We've got this move instruction, moving some variable into ECX, okay? And then immediately after that, we call something. Now, you might see some push instructions in between here. And if, if, we, push, if we move something in, in, into ECX and then we push ECX, chances are it's not into this call, although it is possible. You might pass an object to its own functions. It's kind of weird. 
Um, but generally, uh, you're going to see this ECX is signed before the call and um, then once you get into the function, you'll see right here ECX is moved into this bar four. So this is setting up a, a pointer for within this function. So every time that we want to reference the object itself, it's contained in bar four. So right here we've got bar four moving into EAX, and then we do some offset from EAX. So C so 12 bytes into EAX. So that would be in, in our case here, it'd be getting something in the middle of the name. Okay. So any questions about this pointer? Okay. So we're going to do an example uh, that will make this a little more clear. And you'll see a lot more instances of this behavior where you have the this move and then call. So object member access, I was just talking about how once inside a member function, you'll see so you'll see I have <laughs> renamed bar four or whatever whatever will happen to be in this function to this. Okay, now I can see every place that the this pointer is used. And here we have a bunch of accesses to members. So move this to EAX, and then I get the first item. So the item at position zero in the object. Then I take the object again and take the element at offset four. So when you see a lot of these, these accesses to, to different offsets from any particular pointer, like we have here, then it's, there's a high likelihood that we're dealing with some sort of either structure access or class access. Okay. So, and the difference between um, between structure and class access, by the way, is that within uh, within structures you don't actually have public and private members, and um, so public members are basically things that can be accessed from outside member functions. So a class has a bunch of functions associated with it, and then the main program itself, which uses the class, might actually want to access something within an object. So if I want to manipulate, you know, say, let's say we have a desk as an object, okay? Or how about, um, so, how about a person object? We'll just stick with the with the person object. So, if Matt over here, you know, he he has some some private and some some public uh, public uh, members or, or attributes, right? Some things he he doesn't want me to access, and some things he he, he doesn't mind. So. Um, so private members are going to be are, are going to be things that only he wants to have access to, and public, uh, or for that matter, only he can have access to. So I can't read his thoughts. Bank account. Only he can read his thoughts. <laughs> but publicly accessible, I can I can see what color his shirt is. Okay. You don't want to share that with me. <laughs> So, okay, so another thing that you're going to see is a constructor. Okay, so constructor is I want to create a new person, uh, a new a new object of some type, and I want to set up its. Uh, I want to initialize its its member object, uh, member attributes. Okay, so. Right here, I've got this, this call to new person. I'm setting something to 72, 280, non-safety inspector. So 
Um, safety inspector, it's a person that might be, for instance, uh, a profession, right? Um, so what this is going to look like in assembly is, first of all, when you create any sort of object, you have to initial, uh, you have to allocate space for it. Okay, so I have to actually create this memory for, to put my information in. I need somewhere to store the attributes of the object. Uh, now, this would be a dynamic allocation. So in C, you have uh, right there. I create a pointer to a person. And then I, the new operator here, will actually give me memory. So this is the new operator, and this is uh, this is the common way that Ida defines the new the new operator. This is the function name, and it puts a nice little comment here that tells you it's the new operator. So before, before the call to the new operator, this, this push, that's actually going to be the size of your, of your object. Okay? So when you go into IDA and try to create a structure, <coughs> you can actually uh, try to define something that's 16 bytes or 10 bytes. Okay? And then what you see down here is we've got, we're, we're comparing this R10, which we're getting from the new operator, EAX is the return value. So it goes into bar 10, and then we're comparing that with zero. Uh, if it doesn't succeed or, or returns some, uh, a null pointer, then we're going to come over to here. If it returns a, uh, any pointer to an object, it's going to come over to this side. And here we see. We're taking some local variable, we're putting it in EDX, and we're pushing it. Uh, another push. So this thing, whatever this object is, it has two, two variables that I want to initialize, two, two attributes I want to initialize. And then we see the move ECX into, uh, we're, we're getting the, this pointer into ECX. And then we're going to call the number function. And, and that is the actual code that you would write to say, OK, assign the age, assign the profession. Um, and then it goes on to do it. Matthew, do it. is that call statement then basically a call to MMAP? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it depends I guess on the now implementation. But it, that, you can you can think of it that way, it's, right? It's 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 ma it's gonna malloc or whatever allocation function it, that your operating system uses, or that your compiler uses, rather. So we we have the ability to create this memory space um, for an object. Um, we also may want to get rid of it. So object isn't needed anymore. You know, person died in your game. So you can kill off the person. So we're going to delete him from, from memory. So right here, you'll see a call to delete. And it's, it's preceded by this call up here. So this call is actually uh, where I'm going to free up some, maybe, maybe the name I allocated uh, on the fly. So in my constructor, I said, OK. The name is 12 characters, so I'm going, going to give it 13 characters to space, including the, the null character. Um, here I would do that work of cleaning up after the object, and then this is deleting the object's memory space. So now we're giving that memory back to the computer so we can go ahead and do something else with it. Then we have virtual function tables. So here we have two different classes. We've got the person, and we've got the novelist. 
Okay. And so in general, let's just say a person moves box. So we're going to print move, move. Whatever the person's name is, it moves box. Or they move box. But if you're a specific kind of person, if you're a writer, then your job is writing books. So here we, we define a person. Uh, we, we have a pointer to a person, and we're going to create a new novelist. So I, I want to be able to just access, I, I want to work with, with my, my people, my person objects, in a very generic way. So I, every time I want them to do some work, I just want to call this work function rather than call the write function, the write book function, or the move box function. So here we, we say create a new person pointer. Okay? And it's going to be backed up by data that's actually in the novelist. And then we're going to have that, that writer do some work. So Jeffrey Trosser writes a book. So again, we have initialization code. We got our call to our constructor. Okay. We're, uh, we're passing in a name. And uh, this, this is, this is the, the call to our, the code that we wrote for the constructor. And then what we have down here is we've got this access to this virtual function table. So you'll see right here we have EAX is called, well, where does EAX come from? EAX is the first item in this, uh, it's, it's this item pointed by EDX. EDX comes from ECX. Trace that back up. So bar four is actually out of this one. Okay. So sto store this pointer in the ECX. Then I'm going to take the first value there. So I'm going to get this value right here. This is the address of the, the virtual function table. So now that I've got that address, I'm going to access access the value stored at that location. So I'm going to dereference that, that virtual virtual function table address. And that's going to give me the top item on the virtual function table. So you can see the, the organization of the memory here. We've got the table, it points to this list, and the first item on the list is the, the work function. So any questions about that? Why is the size of 56, or was it 30x? So it's 50 for the name, 4 for the pointer, virtual table pointer. OK, so 4 bytes of that are for the, the, the table. Yep. OK, so it's just a pointer. This is going to be 4 bytes, uh, 8 bytes if you're using 64-bit. Uh, and then the rest probably store the name. So 50 bytes for the name for, for the pointer. So that's 54, but the size so of the struct is 56. We've got 48 and, all right, so we've got 56 bytes. And do you Yeah. Uh, I got it. So the number, slides. so we, we can surmise that there's some space for the name because the name is passed in here. Just because the name is passed in doesn't mean that it's actually not anything's done with it. But uh, I assuming it. <laughs> that we we actually do store that, um, you might guess that yes, we have four bytes for the virtual function pointer, and then another fifty-two bytes for the name. Uh, but maybe there are other members that we don't actually initialize. Okay, so something to keep in mind. So when you're defining a structure, you can start out. You know, loosely, you can say, okay, I know it, it is, it's this size, and there's a, some sort of array stored. Is, is I've, the last thing I've found 
in the memory space, the, the bottommost thing I've found is some sort of an array, so it must run to the end. Later on, something, some code might break that assumption. Okay. So, how does the B table call change if you're like dynamically casting it as you're calling work, calling the work function? I'm sorry. Can you ask if, me? if you if you cast the object in the same line as you're calling the work function, does the B table call change that kind of assembly signature? Okay. So so you're asking. I declare it not as a novelist, but just as I declare Chaucer as a person object. And then right when I call work, I do a, a cast to novelist. OK. OK. So what's, what's going to happen there is um, so if you cast it as it matter. It person, see whether it's, it's a novelist still, or a person, it's always going to call the novelist version of work. Well, well, it's really going to go to the same to table for the same object, yeah. no matter yeah. what. The typing is all is just an artifact of the compiler, right? Right, right. Exactly. So, so yeah, that, because this is all handled at the compiler level, you're you're going to you're still going to call the same same work function. So, right. It is. So so the question is: Is it possible to to call the uh, the parent objects version of the function is that. <coughs> well, I mean, you can always call the parents version. So if you create a generic base class, at least in C++, you still have the ability to dynamically cast and call subclass methods. Right. In, in line. So does the V table look up? Active right, but that's activity. only for functions that aren't overridden. Okay, so if if the child chooses not to override the, the function of the base class, then it will call the base class, and that will actually be contained in this this function table. So, so what the compiler does is when it goes through, when when it compiles a, a child object, it starts building up this table and says, does the child override the parent? If it does. Stick its pointer in here. Otherwise, get the parents function function pointer and just throw that in the table. Okay. So, so is the setup of the V table getting done new, during the new? And what's hiding inside the new operator? So, is it allocates yeah. memory and then, but it sets the. The, the new operator doesn't do that. So, um, so talked about how we call the new operator, and then we call this function here. So this function is is the constructor. Mm -hmm. the, this is this is actually the code that would be defined right here. Okay. So this is a constructor. And what this does is just it does a string copy from whatever that input pointer is to the uh, to the, the actual member variable name, which you see up at the top. It's char. Who's mm -hmm. the, the, the compiler adds in the code to actually store the fun the, the virtual function pointer. So, so that's something, despite the fact that you didn't actually write it into, into here, that's handled by the compiler and it inserts that code. Got it inserted into the constructor or? Right. Yeah. Okay, so we've got here the struct introduction executable. Does everybody have that? Can we do this on the Win7? Or do we need to be in the VMs again? This one, uh, so the only reason why we did that, and we can come back to that at the end of the day, um, why it is that I asked you to use Windows XP instead of 
Windows 7. But the reason for that was to do with how I was getting the, the API function. So when I was having the thing load up, uh, load resource, find resource A, all those functions, that was done um, in, in a way that Windows 7 broke. OK. No, it's just a slight modification. In fact, one instruction could be inserted in that code to fix it so that it would, it would work properly. But if, you, if you're interested in that, at the end of the day, I'll, I can walk through it. And it will give you a little insight as to how Windows 7 changed. Does everybody have struct introduction .exe? That was located in labs.zip. Yeah, so if I run this, just like everything else, it doesn't do anything. Actually, it does something, but it goes away quickly. So I'm going to run it from command line. And you can see. Homer is 38 years old and is married to Marge. Marge is 37 years old and is married to Homer. All right. You see if it's the kids' ages wrong. What's that? Yeah, the kids' ages wrong. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Zeno pointed this out. <laughs> <laughs> I know who the Abbott, Abbott Simpsons fans are when I. When I put this up here, so I leave it in there like that. Nerd detector. <laughs> All right. So <coughs> let's see here. What I'd like you to do is go ahead and just play around with this, look around, uh, and I'd like you to give me some idea of. What these things might look like. So, and then then I'll I'll walk through it and just talk about. Actually, um, you know what? I'll walk through this with you guys. So, I said you could dynamically allocate an object, all right, using the new operator, but we don't always do this dynamically. You might actually create a person object right on uh, right on the stack. So draw this up here. So let's say we have our main fun function here. So if I do this, that is going to create an actual person object on the stack. Okay. Meaning that these variables would somehow represent the, uh, the a person object. Um, now, if I dynamically allocate it, chances are there will just be a, a single four byte uh, four byte value reserved on the stack for that that object. Okay, because all we need is a pointer to the object. The, the operating system goes and makes memory somewhere else for us to put our information. So that means that this guy right here was created dynamically. So var 38 is what? Pointer. OK. Two is the one. Okay. As is 14. And the Say it again. It looks like everything except var 34 is a pointer. Okay. And why are you suggesting that? Because var 34 is 20 bytes long. Everything else is 4 bytes long. I think. Var 34 is 20 bytes long. Because it goes 38, 34, 14. 
15. Or sorry, is hex 20 by its long? OK, OK. So one thing I want to point out is that I doesn't always write. Uh, well, if we drop that assumption, who knows? Right, so I is purely basing these, are, uh, these variables. It creates these because there was a reference right. to some offset. So let's see here. I'm going to turn off. So let's take a look at var 8, for instance. Right now, I'm going to change it to just a, a I'm going to remove the, the, the local variable reference that Ida was st sticking in here for me. What we really have is EBP minus 8. So remember, we enter the function. EBP is set up. So we're setting the base of the stack for this function. So all these things that say var 34, arg, v, all this stuff, those are just relative offsets to the base of the stack. So you got this return from me. Then we've got this push EVP. So get yeah, right here. And then we have what Ida refers to as bar four. So we've got zero four. here is that Ida actually assumes it, it has recognized this push EVP instruction. Okay. And even though the function, when we, we jumped to this function, when we enter here, the stack technically would be right here. This would be the stack pointer. We want, to, we want this to be based according to where EVP is after we've moved ESP into EVP. Now we have negative 4. Okay. So the, these variable names, they just represent some offset from, from this, this point in the stack. And so Ida is just giving a somewhat arbitrary name. R4 wasn't used in the code. Okay. R, uh, RC was used in the code. Uh, but that's because Ida understands it's a main function, and the signature for that main function is that the first item is RC, and the next item is RB. Okay, so I just saying I saw some offset to from EBP to negative eight. So I'm going to create a variable, and since it's eight bytes off, I'm going to have it have an eight at the end. And because it's negative, that says it's a local variable, so it puts this var underscore. Okay. So that's how Ida determines what name to 
the place here. So, despite the fact that these look like individual variables that were, were created during the, uh, um, what, when this code was written, these actually could be remember, so, uh, members of a structure. So maybe I have a structure that goes from bar 34 to bar 4. And this code actually accesses individual members of this structure directly. So because it does that, it actually thinks these structure members are, are variables, which in essence they are, but they belong to, to a higher level object. Okay, so var 34 uh, is loaded in the, in the EAX. We, we push it just before string copy, and we copy Lisa into there. Okay. So what might you surmise about var 34? What's the name? It's a name? Okay. So it <clears throat> could be a name. All right. So this used elsewhere. It isn't. Okay. So we know know this thing has some sort of a name. Um and Lisa is statically out. Okay. We also see Homer is used bar 8 for storing this Homer into bar 8. Let's just take a look at this location here. Scroll down we see a bunch of null bytes. Potentially this name has a larger space than Homer will fill. Okay, see some sort of an integer. We see an offset to the name March. And from there we see an offset to the name Bart. So there are two possibilities here. We could have, this could be a name pointer or because we're seeing kind of a, a, so the space between the name here and Bart, 2C to 5.4. So subtract 5.4 from, or 2C from 5.4. Anybody do that math for me? Open up the help. Is everybody familiar with uh, with the scientific version of calc? It's uh, uh, actually there's a program. X twenty eight decimal forty. X twenty eight. X twenty eight decimal forty. Okay. And what about the distance between Homer at five eight and? You say five eight or five a? Five eight. And. This pointer to Marge, 8, 0. So we want 8, 0 minus 5C, or 5, 8, sorry. So this has actually changed since Windows XP, the calculator. Um, used to have scientific, and you could choose between hex, decimal, and so on. Now there's this programmer calculator. 28 again. So right, you can do 8, 0 minus 5, 8. Yeah, 28. Okay. You're in decimal. I'm in decimal. Oh, there we go. Zero. Okay. You typed 81, yeah, you typed so 81. that's so, yeah. the same number. <laughs> Other C. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not used to this bird. Okay, so 28. So 
you can. Uh, what I'm trying to point out here is that these things are they, they look very very similar in in the way they're laid out in the memory. So, what, where this could be a pointer to uh, a string, it could also be a pointer to another object. You go back to main. So one thing we don't see in main is the word Bart. <laughs> so why is that? That's a good question. Um, well, the reason why we see Homer here and Marge here is there's some sort of assignment, right? Um, apparently we maybe don't do anything with Bart or we don't access them directly. Right? Maybe maybe we do it through some some chain of in the uh, structure. Right, exactly. So who can tell me how big our structure is? I'd hazard it would be that. I'll tell you it's on the screen right in front of us right now. 2C? 2C. Okay. So our operator, our operator new, that's going to take in the size of the object that we want to create space for. Okay? So, we can actually create a structure and call it person. So, to get to here, uh, we're going to do shift up 9, I believe. Shift up 9. And then once we're in here, we hit insert. Type in a name. What I know is they're all Simpson characters, so why not call it Simpson? All right. And then we know that there's a name in there somewhere. to create some sort of an array. And right now, I know this thing is 2C uh, two bytes. So for now, I'm going to say the array size is 2C. Make sure you put an OX in front, OX 2C. And there we have our structure. I'm going to give it a name. I just press N. When I select field zero, label it name. Now let's explore a little bit more. Okay. So we have this person pointer. This is what came from our operator new. And I want to see how it's used. So here we've got it, we've, we've moved it into EDX. And then we store it into bar 4. So we know that bar 4 is either another person pointer or it could be a string pointer. Now why do I say that? Okay, so So, 
What is our person pointer pointing to? Zero. Zero. Zero offset. So we could either be pointing at the object itself, or we could be pointing at the first item on, on the object. Okay. So I'm going to call this. Stick with my convention of using a question mark because I don't really know. Doesn't the object have the uh, virtual function? Oh, yeah. Say that again? Uh, doesn't the object have the virtual function table at the beginning? Uh, and what, what gave you that impression? Uh, I thought you said that earlier. That, that, that's how functions work. Well, that depends, okay? So, in what case will we actually have a, a function, a virtual function pointer table at the beginning of our object? Did you have to inherit it? Right. So, it has to be inherited, Willie. So, in other words, it looks like that this person class is the end all be all. There is no, there's no child class. This is a base class, okay, and it doesn't seem to have any inheritance. I see. Does that yes, make sense? Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. So we look down here. I had, I had asked, well, is this thing a name or a person? Okay, you can see all the usages of this thing. And it's used over and over again here. We see it moved into ECX, and then we see off, some offset to it. Okay? So this tells us a couple things. First of all, we know this is a Person pointer. Person pointer. Okay. Uh, and I can be a little bit more specific because I have an idea of which person it is. So who can tell me who this is? Okay, so. It is Maggie, and other than the fact that I see Maggie on, right, on the screen right near here, we've got this called a string copy, okay? So we move per, the, the person pointer into EAX, but the person pointer also is a pointer to the, the name string, okay? So we're going to copy into the name this other parameter here, Maggie, and it's supposedly 32 bytes. So, and, and generally, when you call string copy, this this value here, this this third parameter, which is 32 bytes, that is the max size. So that I I would generally say. I've allocated 32 bytes for this this thing, so only write 32 bytes at the most. So I can go back to my structure here and change this. So I'm going to click on name within the structures window. I'm going to press A. I'm going to change this size now to 32. Or you can do hex 20. Oh, hex 20. Okay. And I see three different member accesses, okay? So we've got one at 20, one at 24, one at 28. 
So I'm going to go back to my structures window. I'm going to hit D three times after I click on the bottom Simpson here. Should end up with field 20. I'm going to click on the bottom Sim Simpson here again, this end S line. In fact, you can click on end S. Press D three times. I'm going to do it one more time. And that gets us up to a size of 2C, which we said was the size of our structure. Okay. Now, what are these things? First of all, so I showed you yesterday if you click on these structure offsets, if you press T, you'll be able to choose what structure offset we're dealing with here. Field 20, and note that this restricts it to anything that's 24 bytes from the base of the structure object, okay? So it gave me field 20 last time. This time I'm on EDX plus 24. It gives me field 24. Is there a way to override that? Like if there's a pointer to the middle of the structure and you're doing offsets from that for some ungodly reason? Um, Can you force it to say this is that field? Um, you might be able to create a stack variable. OK. Oh, I, that would work, yeah. Um, I like that. There, there could be an issue. Uh, you might be able to do that. Um, but as far as, as uh, another method, if that stack variable is already taken, that that is something that they'll probably have to consult the the item book or something. I don't I don't know yeah, if that's in there. I don't recall that being in there, but might want to check some other sources. So. I've got all these different offsets, and right now I really don't know what they are, and this is not really helping me at all. Um, we're moving one into field 20, we're moving zero into field 24, we're moving zero into 28. But using the information I have from before, I can actually at least sort out one of these things. So, can we just use? Um you know, the breakpoints in the middle so you can see, okay, here's what ECX is, EDX is, and EAX is. But Maggie's one. Uh, you could. You could debug this. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, now, this, this is taking a leap here, making assumptions, all right? So I'm assuming that when this message is printed out, Maggie is one years old, that that is containing only information about this Maggie struct. So if that were the case, then what can you tell me about one of these these items here? Field 20 is age. Okay, so field 20 is age. So we'll try that. So but to, to clarify that, we'll, we'll dig further, okay? We see these output messages we've had. We had. Um, this might have been a, a good starting point. So you ran this thing, you saw its behavior, you wanted to understand how, why it printed out these messages. The first thing you might do is say, okay, well, where's printf? Where are these strings? Um, and you can see we've got this, this output message here. Uh, printf, some format string is blank years old. So we'd expect that offset 20 to be used for, for this percent %d here, right? And we'd expect the name offset to be used for this percent %s. So take a look above here. We have ECX plus 20. So there's what we said was our, our age offset. So hit T. 
page, and that kind of clears things up for us, so pretty confident that that's age. Now, we see var 8 here is, is going to be our object, okay? In fact, at the beginning here, we moved Homer into var 8. So, I'm going to call this guy Homer. Bar 8 is now Homer. And we got his age. And then this, this other push before our printout here. We got this percent %s. Okay, that's, that's going to be the name. But why can't I give this thing an offset? Well, that's a problem with the way... So, Right here, we're getting the base of the object, OK? Now, next thing you'd expect is to reference some offset from that base. But since the name is actually at the base, you don't actually have that plus 0. So as far as trying to force this, you can, yeah, you can do a manual. Can do a manual. So I don't know if you're able to actually, when you do manual, um, um, you're able to do a manual here? Yeah, oh, you're saying line above there. Oh, yeah. Line above. Okay. So, so what you can do here instead of actually using this Simpson.age offset thing, you can actually put name here or over dot name. So when, when you can't use uh, use this, uh, like the structure offset feature or one of the other features for that matter, um, when, when they're not available to you, go ahead and try using a comment. And I use the semicolon to do that. Semicolon will give you this dialog. Type in your comment and click OK. So once I've done that, I know I now come over to this line of code. I'm moving Homer into ECX, and I'm getting this offset 24. Now that's one we haven't figured out yet. It's going to just show up as Simpson.field24. I'm comparing that with 0. If it's 0, I'm going to come to the right. And if it's not 0, I'm going to come to the left here. Now, once again, I take the Homer pointer. I get offset 24 again. And now I'm going to push that onto this call here. So I've got two pushes and is married to percent s. So what do you think, what would you call this field 24? Spouse. Spouse. Who's, who's married to? So this is a spouse pointer. And by zero, it really means null, right? Right. So if they didn't have a spouse, then we wouldn't output. We wouldn't output. So what we've got here now is we've got this loop. We're printing out each person. And if they're married, then we go ahead and out this. Otherwise, we're going to go to this side here and skip the spouse. And then we go ahead and get 
offset 28, and we start the loop all over again. So rather than calling this Homer, what would be a more accurate name for this? this person, point? person or Simpson or something. person? Okay, or current. So it's in a loop, and it's referencing the current object we're concerned with. Simpson family network. Right. Okay, so, so what would, would you call this last offset then? If, if we're going through uh, this list and we, we change the current pointer, right? So it's, it's basically a linked list of people. <coughs> Shift up nine again. We're going to name this thing next. So maybe a better name for this would be person node. So that's how you create structures and apply their uh, apply their member names. Any questions? Yeah, how do you apply structures to the to the data? Like we did, I think we did that yesterday, but I'm trying to do it here. Okay. And it won't let me. Good question. So once you've created your structure uh, structure definition, you may actually actually want to apply it to memory. So I'm going to go to the very top of the main function. I'm going to click on this offset to Homer. Click here. I don't have the option to, to define a, a structure, so I have to just remember that Alt Q allows me to define a, a structure type. And you see, we have a person node here. Did that work for you? Alt Q, yeah. Alt Q. And yes, I'd like to directly convert that to a structure. And I could do the same thing for the next person. We've got Marge here. Click on Marge, or Q, find that as a person. And I can do the same for part. All right. Hey, Matt. Yep. So, if yeah. your uh, person had Sorry. a method attached to it, would um, would there just be a pointer back from the data segment back to the text segment for the code for that method? Bill, can we turn up the volume? Is that possible? Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I was wondering if the if the uh, if the object had a method. Uh, would there just be a pointer back from the data section where the object is residing back to the text segment for the code for that method? Okay, it's dependent on so you always you always pass in the object pointer. Um, so, for instance, you pass it in using the, uh, I showed you the this pointer. Okay, so um, how about this? Um, we're, we're, we're actually going to see this in the next example. In fact, uh, we've got, the last thing we're going to do today is look at the, the file that I dropped. And I'm going to walk over that briefly, and that's one of the things I'm going to cover is that is what a function call looks like for, for a member. And then after that, um, I'm going to have you guys go ahead and try to figure out the class definition or the class definitions for uh, that were used to build the, the dropped executable. So um, go ahead and take, let's go, take a break until 2.30, and then we'll go over that, okay?